Hello genealogists, it's Craig again with Just Genealogy. So today I thought we'd talk about reasons for not serving in the Civil War. There are a lot of reasons for why someone might not serve in the Civil War, but there's always the possibility that you haven't looked far enough to be sure that your person actually didn't serve in the Civil War. And because we have the opportunity during the Civil War for some people to fight on both sides, you've got to look on both sides of the of the war regardless. So you're going to need to search the indexes to compiled service records for Union soldiers state by state, or you're just going to go out and look in the index on Fold 3, or you're going to search for the consolidated index to compiled service records for Confederate soldiers. Well, you're not going to do that either because every single compiled military service record for Confederates is available on Fold 3. But there is this thing about compiled military service records. They don't include certain people. They don't include the regular U.S. Army. They don't include the Navy. And they don't include the Marine Corps. Now, if you've got a Marine serving in the Civil War, the easiest thing to do is to go to Ancestry and check the Marine Corps payrolls, muster rolls that are on Ancestry. And that should be fairly easy to do. But what we're actually going to talk about is if you've got somebody in the regular U.S. Army, the best thing for you to do is go either to Ancestry or to Fold 3 and look in the Register of Enlistments. Now, there is a microfilm publication for the Navy called Rendezvous Reports that deal with the Civil War, but I don't know of those being available anywhere digitally yet but I will research that further and talk to you at some point in time about that in the future. But those are called rendezvous reports and they are microfilm publications. So there's no reason why one of the subscription services won't eventually get to it if they haven't already. Conscription existed on both sides and it came about as a result of people no longer volunteering in great numbers, especially beginning in the second year of the war people began to realize on both sides that this was not going to be a quick war. It wasn't going to end soon. It was easier if you were on the Union side to avoid the draft than it was on the Confederate side, but there were still ways on both sides to get it done. So what I'm going to talk about first is the Confederate experience, and they were the first ones to have a draft. There was a National Conscription Act adopted on 16 April 1862, it's in the CSA statutes, and it authorized a call-up of all white men between the ages of 18 and 35 for three-year terms, bound men already in the Army to serve for three years, and to allow units to reorganize and elect their own officers. Big mistake. You don't want to ever be in an Army that elects their own officers because they don't necessarily elect tactically strategic-oriented officers. They elect their best friends. Later in 1863, the age limit was raised to 45. And in 1864, the lower limit was set at 17. Men between 45 and 50 were conscripted for local defense and detail duty. I actually think that's what happened to my great-great-grandfather in Richmond, being a member of the Home Guard during the war, because he was of that age. Another place you want to look is the 1864 enrollment of free Negroes and the employment of 20,000 slaves authorized for auxiliary service. There's a great book out there that traces the actions of the Confederate Congress in regards to the enrollment of free Negroes into the Confederate Army and into Confederate service. That's in view of the great want of labor by Renee Ingram. And it takes information from the Register of Free Negroes enrolled and detailed May 1864 to January 1865, found in the National Archives in Record Group 109, the War Department Collection of Confederate Records. So what the Confederates did is they created a Bureau of Conscription as part of the Adjutant Inspector General's Office, the AIGO, and on 30 December 1862, the AIGO through the General Order 112 created that bureau. 
and that bureau supervised the activities of inspectors of inscription, which were appointed for each state. You can search newspapers for the time period. This one happens to be from the Weekly Standard in Raleigh, 29 July 1863, where Peter Mallet is identified as the Commandant of Conscripts for North Carolina. And he has created a, a conscript office at Camp Holmes. So this is a picture of Peter Mallet. I'm focusing tonight pretty much on North Carolina, just as an example of what you might be able to find for a state. His adjutant was J.W. Mallet, uh, probably his son. Don't know that off the top of my head, but as we go along, maybe I'll be able to tell you. And Peter Mallet's papers uh, are found in the Southern Historical Collection at the University of North Carolina. So he was a merchant from Fayetteville, North Carolina and New York City and a Confederate Army officer who headed up the Confederate Bureau of Conscription in North Carolina. And these papers include his business, his military and personal correspondence, chiefly through the 50s through the 80s, some diaries. I would be interested in seeing the one for 1861, but remember that that's before he's put in charge of the Bureau of Conscription. So that's probably his during his active service as an officer in the field. And then the Civil War letters and letter copy books from the conscription office in Raleigh, North Carolina. This is one of the problems with conscription material is that most of it, with the exception of Virginia and some of Mississippi, is located outside of the National Archives. So there are federal records in Record Group 109, the War Department collection of Confederate records. There a, is a finding aid. It's a finding aid that has my name on it. I enjoy doing that. These records are located at NAR in Washington, D.C. in Archives 1. And then for the Union experience, we'll talk about Record Group 110, the Provost Marshal records and the finding aids that are available for those. And they are located in NARA. And for North Carolina, they're in Atlanta. The Provost Marshal records for the Union side are located in the regional archives that serves the state from which they, the soldiers served. So in Record Group 109, the War Department Collection of Confederate Records, there are records for Virginia and some records remain for Mississippi. So that may or may not be helpful to you. We identified where the North Carolina ones were in the personal papers of Peter Mallet. The best source for information on records in other custody concerning the state Concerning the state conscription offices is found in the Confederacy, a guide to the archives in the, uh, to the government of the Confederate States of America. And you would find information about the Peter Mallet papers on page 242. They created camps of instruction and in North Carolina, they were found at Camp Hill, Camp Holmes, Stokes, Vance, in Garysburg and in Goldsboro. Now, the reasons for not ser serving largely related to the needs of the Confederacy. So what you need to determine is there a family tradition concerning occupation. So are we dealing with a farmer, a Confederate official, a state official, a railroad employee, a physician, a druggist, an apothecary, a minister, a teacher, a mail contractor, a newspaper employee, or an editor? All of these people were necessary to the Confederacy running, and the Confederacy fighting, too. A person could, though, be detailed in support of the war. And basically, that's what happened to farmers, tanners, millers, blacksmiths, shoemakers, wheelwrights, members of the government bureaus, artisans and mechanics, contractors who furnished supplies, and telegraph companies. You would be detailed in support of the war, and if you didn't provide sufficient support, you just made yourself eligible to be drafted. Now, railroads were necessary to the prosecution of the war, so anybody involved with the railroad was not going to be drafted. And these included railroad agents, station agents, baggage masters, road masters, watchmen, foremen of timber and bridge gangs, section masters, conductors, brakemen, carpenters, machinists, firemen, tie contractors, 
a tie contractor is the guy who creates the timber that goes underneath the rail. Blacksmiths, engineers, wood contractors, and pattern makers. So these people would all be undraftable because the Confederacy needed their railroads to run. In the civil administration, well, that had to go on regardless of the war. So judges, justice of the peace, magistrates, constables, tax collectors, jailers, clerk of courts, commissioners, postmasters, sheriffs, deputy sheriffs, salt agents, legislators, members of the board of police, probate clerks, those kinds of people were going to be undraftable. Interestingly enough, an overseer of a number of slaves was usually also exempt. Remind me to fix that slide. Disabled persons were also exempt. For Virginia, we have agricultural exemption books, and they show the name of the person exempted, what county, what they look like, what the post office was, how many farmhands they had, and what they were supplying, and the bond for that supplying, and the securities and witnesses, and the date of their exemption. So there is a register of those. Let me blow that up a little bit so you can see it. That basically says they're providing stuff so therefore they don't get drafted. Can't run an army without food and forage. Then here's a list of some state officials whose job were, were exempted. Jay Smith, who worked in the gas works in Richmond. Hugh Smith was an assistant inspector in Richmond. Uh, Eli W. Scott was a deputy clerk in Montgomery County. So there's a volume of exemptions for state officials in Virginia available in the National Archives. And that's pretty much what this looks like. And you can see the RR in the center of the page. That's a railroad. And then above that, you see the word substitute. That's because that individual paid for somebody else to take his place. The price varied. Usually it started out at about 300 and by the end of the war it was up to 500 So that's the Confederate experience. The Union experience is a little bit different, but not much. The Provost Marshal's General's Bureau was established in 1863. It centralized the functions of enrolling, drafting, and recruiting men for service in the Union Army. There was a Provost Marshal assigned to each district, and he was responsible for reporting and arresting deserters detecting spies, and transferring drafted men or substitutes to depots or rendezvous. They did that under the Enrollment Act of 3 March 1863. Prior to that time, these duties were carried out by the individual states. So the adjutant general in the state would be responsible for identifying those individuals by name who would be eligible for the draft and drafting them. Some of those records, I think for Indiana or Illinois, not sure off the top of my head, the state records are available on Ancestry. But the Enrollment Act of March 3rd, 1863 fixed it so that enrollment districts would be created. And they were based on the congressional districts that existed at that time. The provost marshal took over the function for the states at that time. That was the 38th Congress, second session. So whatever congressional districts existed at that point in time, the, you would find that that was the Provost Marshal District, the congressional district of the 38th Congress, second session. Now, Nancy Morbeck has created a Civil War draft records book and index to congressional districts that allows you to crosswalk from county into congressional district in that period, and there is her address. So you'll see that there are there may be more than one district within a city or county. So looking at Allen County, Indiana, there was the 10th district. In Baltimore City, there were one to seven wards and the second district. And in Baltimore County, there was a fifth district. And in St. Louis, there was the first through the third wards. They made up the second district and the fourth through the 10th wards made up the first district. So St. Louis would have two sets of provost marshals one for the first to third wards and one for the fourth to tenth wards. I found some newspaper cartoons from the time period. Uh, this one is called The Draft. Drafted, yes, Maria, drafted. I'm so short. If they shoot at my legs, they'll hit me in the head. I know it, Maria. I know it. 
Well, a lot of people were not really happy with the draft. There were a few draft riots. So there was created a board of enrollment in each congressional district, in each provost marshal's district. So it consisted of the district provost marshal, a commissioner, and a surgeon. So their duties, the board of enrollment, was to enroll men within the district and examine the persons enrolled, drafted, or recruited. The Army had decided by this time that too many unfit people were ending up in the Army, and they were a burden, so they were going to make sure that at this point in time, they only got fit people in the Army so that the Army would not have to worry about it. Now, these records are found in Record Group 110, the records of the Provost Marshal General's Bureau, Civil War, and the ones for North Carolina are located in Atlanta. Uh, the ones for Pennsylvania are located in Philadelphia, for example. The ones in Colorado are located in Colorado. There's Wherever there's a regional archives, you'll know Illinois, Chicago, all that kind of stuff. Pretty straightforward. They're found, there are various clusters. Denver doesn't really have very much. Uh, one cubic foot. San Bruno, California has 13 cubic feet. Uh, there is um, these, they may not have updated this when they moved most of it out of Washington, D.C. into the regional archives, but you can see that Philadelphia has a good bit, and that makes sense. So you want to contact the National Archives branch, the regional archives, to see which one has um, you want to determine which one has your provost marshal materials. Atlanta has Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, South Carolina, Florida, Kentucky, North Carolina, Tennessee. And there's a finding aid to the high-level view of this, and that's the Union, and it matches the Confederacy. So if we're looking for provost marshal records that exist outside of where you would expect to find them, this is where you would look them up. I can remember years ago, 20, 25 years ago, finding some Oaths of Allegiance, certificates that were Oaths of Allegiance, and they were in Iowa. I couldn't figure out why they were in Iowa. And it turned out the provost marshal that was in Iowa had originally been in Tennessee. So these actually, when they were examined, I found that these were Tennessee Oaths of Allegiance, and they, in fact, I published them in Ant Search and News at the time so that the Tennessee folk could know where they were. So there are various uh, volumes of the finding aids. There's a total of eight of them. And here we can see that one is the central office, two is, May is New England, three is New York, four is New Jersey and Pennsylvania, five is the Mid-Atlantic, uh, six is Ohio and Indiana, seven is Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Iowa, and eight is the rest. So if we look at the third congressional district for Illinois, we'll see that there's a list showing results of medical examinations of enrolled men claiming exemption from the draft, August 64 to February 65, four volumes, arranged chronologically by examination, but name indexes are available. There is also a medical register of examinations of enrolled men for 1865, the first couple of months, and it's arranged chronologically by the of examination, and again, name indexes are available. And then there is a medical register of examinations of drafted men for one month in October of 1864. It's arranged chronologically by date of examination. Most of these are, and most of them do have name indexes available. You'll also see that there's, there are multiple lists of drafted men. There are multiple registers of officers examined. There are monthly medical reports of drafted men, recruits, and substitutes. There are medical registers of drafted men and substitutes and medical records of men examined in hospitals by the boards of examination. So let's talk about exemption for a bit. The reasons for exemption for service in the North appear to be very similar to those for the Confederacy, except for the overseer of slaves part. A major focus of the Board of Enrollment, according to the Provost Marshal General James B. Fry, was that recruits were rapidly obtained by voluntary enlistment or draft, and such strict regard was paid to their physical fitness before accepting it as to greatly reduce 
the enormous loss on account of discharge for physical disability, which prevailed during the first two years of the war. By the end of the war, the Provost Marshal General believed that over a million men had been examined. So the records look something like this. This is a record of exemptions granted by the Board of Enrollment. Let me blow it up a little bit. So it gives you the date, the name of the individual, a description of the individual, what their occupation was, where they are. And if you go a little bit farther over, it talks about what the, where they were enrolled, where they were, where they were born, where they were enrolled, and what their remarks are. So you can see loss of an eye is reason for exemption. An inguinal hernia is reason for exemption. Loss of teeth, and you had to, two teeth had to oppose each other in order to fire a weapon during the Civil War. Epilepsy was a reason for exemption. Loss of a limb would be a reason for exemption. And any obvious disease process, any debility would, would work. Now, there was a presidential proclamation announced that aliens at the initial draft, aliens who had exempt from, and nobody liked that. So anyone beginning in 8 May 1863, the president announced by proclamation that aliens who had declared their intention to become citizens and who were in the United States 65 days after 8 May would not be allowed to avoid the draft on plea of non-citizenship. Another cartoon, your age, sir, my age, Oh, exactly 63. Do you mean 33? No, 63. I was born the year George Washington died, and I remember the circumstance. There are in, in many, not each, but many of the Provost Marshal District's books that deal with exemptions. So this one happens to be from New York, and it is the aliens describing why they are aliens and how they are aliens and why they are exempt under the first draft. Here's, there are several lists that are available in the various Provost Marshal districts that deal with exemptions. This is a list of drafted men called into service. So it's likely that these people may have served. It does not mean that they served. They may not have made it through the medical examination process. Now, there's another place that you can look for union folk to see why they might not be drafted, and that's the internal revenue assessment list. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but there are certain occupations, and this is a good place to find occupations if you're unaware of what their occupation is between 1862 and 1865. And the purpose of the act was to provide internal revenue to support the government and pay interest on the public debt. In other words, execute the war. So there were taxes on manufacturers, articles, and products from beer to zinc, those kind of products. And there were monthly taxes on the gross receipts of transportation companies, interest paid on bonds, surplus funds accumulated by financial institutions, gross receipts from auction sales and sales of slaughtered cattle, hogs, and sheep. There were quarterly taxes on gross receipts from newspaper ads. And there was an annual tax on income in excess of $600, legacies, and distributive shares of personal property. There also were stamp duties on legal and business documents, medicines, playing cards, and cosmetics. It doesn't have anything to do with conscription, but this is just how the government was making money at the time. There is information in North Carolina, but you can see what counties they are. Um, District 1 is Beaufort, excuse me, um, Bertie, Camden, and then District 2 is Carteret, Craven, Duplin, and these go on. District 3 begins with Anson, District 4 begins with Chatham, District 5, Alamance, District 6, Alexander. District 7 is Allegheny, Ash, Buncombe, Burke. I guess it's geographic to some extent. This is on um, microfilm for each state. Here's what some of it looks like. And what we're interested in is looking at occupations. 
So like a physician here is not going to be drafted. However, lots of physicians served. There was no special draft for physicians. Blow it up a little bit. So you can look at these records and get an idea about why they have an occupation that may make them not eligible for the draft. So this has been Craig at Just Genealogy, lightly dealing with conscription during the Civil War. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't. Click that button so you get notified when you see something from me. And again, this is just genealogy, where we're converting people doing genealogy into genealogists day by day. Thank you so much.